Hello, everyone, and welcome to another mini sky tonight. So as the Thanksgiving holiday is getting close, I wanted to show you folks some of the constellations, planets and things that you can see over the holiday. I know that many of us are having to be stuck at home and not going to go visit family. So I figured, why not take a step outside and enjoy the nighttime sky with the ones that are closest to you and to spend some quality time together. So allow me to show you some of the things that you can see. So the program, again, I'm using is called Stellarium. I'll leave a link in the description below if you wanna download it for free for your computer and you can play around with it as much as you would like. It's free and I always enjoy it because it's easy to use as well as it keeps becoming updated constantly with new information in terms of satellites and so on. So I have the sky set to what it looks like on Thanksgiving evening around about seven o'clock. So if you step outside and look towards the southwest, you'll see these kind of two bright stars close together. Those are actually not stars. They are the planets Jupiter and Saturn. So why don't we take a closer look at these two particular planets and see what you can see with a small pair of binoculars or a telescope. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna center it right here that's one of the unique features of Stellarium is that you can center it on the screen and easily zoom. And using your scroll wheel, you can zoom in on this object. And this is what you would see with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. Ah, sorry. You also have to press pause on the motion right down here because if you don't, it will keep going because as the earth rotates, the sky will constantly move from your frame. So what will you see with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope? Well, the great thing about it is that if you zoom in closely, you kind of kind of see this little red dot right here. So around about seven o'clock at night on Thanksgiving evening, you get to see the great red spot of Jupiter. It's a huge tropical storm that has existed for thousands of years in the same location. So how does this work? Well, like storms here on Earth, you have a high pressure zone and a low pressure zone that are constantly ramming together. And in this particular area, those, when you have a high pressure zone, a low pressure zone that meet is when you get a storm. And in the case of Jupiter, since it rotates once every 10 hours, so it has two days for every single day that we have, since it rotates so fast, instead of the curly Q jet streams like we have here on Earth, Jupiter's cloud tops are straight bands. And so since it has straight bands, those high pressure zones and low pressure zones stay about the same spot because it rotates so fast. And because of this, you get a storm in that spot. Now, scientists do believe it has fluctuated over the course of the years and it may diminish, but we don't know. We're keeping an eye on it. But nonetheless, that huge storm is so big that all the rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, fit inside of it. It's huge. And the winds there have been said to be clocked at over 400 miles per hour. So it's a ridiculous storm. You do not want to get caught in one of these storms. But nonetheless, Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system. In fact, it is so big that 1,400 Earths could fit inside the planet. In fact, it's so big, just as another size comparison, all the other planets could fit inside Jupiter. Not including Saturn's rings. If you exclude Saturn's rings, if you just put Saturn and all the other planets inside Jupiter, they would fit comfortably inside. Crazy, right? But for as big as Jupiter is, it's mostly composed of gas. Now, it does have a huge magnetic field, so astronomers believe that it does have a liquid hydrogen core of some kind, but we don't know. Hopefully with the new instruments that are around Jupiter right now called Juno, we're learning more about Jupiter as we speak. In fact, Juno was made here in San Antonio. So we're kind of touching the cosmos from our own backyard. So that's pretty cool. Nonetheless, not only do you get to see the beautiful colored bands, the cloud tops of Jupiter and the great red spot, but you see these three little dots to the left and right of Jupiter. 
those are the Galilean moons of Jupiter. They're named Galilean moons because they were first discovered by Galileo Galilei. The one over here is Io. The one here is Europa. And the other one is Callisto. In fact, is Ganymede? Ganymede may be behind Jupiter at this point. But that's okay. So you get to see three of the four Galilean moons, which is pretty cool. So let's zoom out and take a look at Saturn. All right, we're back here on Earth and we're gonna click here on Saturn. We're going to center it and now we're gonna zoom in using our scroll wheel. And just to give you a rough idea, this is what you would roughly see in a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. It's still a pretty cool sight to see. In fact, Saturn is often nicknamed the Lord of the Rings, although all gas giants do have rings. It's just Saturn's is the most epic and hence why it's given the title Lord of the Rings. But that's one of the big features that many people notice when they first see Saturn is like, wow, it really does have rings. I can't count to you the number of times that people have come to the observatory in the past. And when I showed them Saturn, they're like, no, that can't be real. It's you put a sticker on the end of the telescope. I can assure you it is not a sticker. We would not have this beautiful big telescope at our center just to put a sticker at the end of it. I can assure you what you would see is what you would see in your textbooks. And when they get to see it, it's phenomenal. In fact, sometimes if you look very carefully with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, especially with a good sized telescope, you can see this dark faint ring. And allow me to show you that dark faint ring is. That dark faint ring is known as Cassini's division. It's a natural gap in the rings created by the moons of Saturn and Saturn itself. It's kind of like a gravitational re resonance sort of thing. But the rings are incredibly long, but they're exceptionally thin. In fact, the average thickness of the rings is the distance between the two goalposts on an American football field. So you can literally fit Saturn's rings across our planet and it's that thin. That's something to keep in mind. And it's mostly composed of particles, some as big as a house to tiny little particles as big as a pebble. Now, Saturn's rings are not just singular rings. In fact, we scientists have noticed that it has multiple different sections of rings and they've been able to label them. I think it goes all the way to the F ring and they labeled it alphabetically A, B, C, D, E, F. And the F ring is a unique ring because it's on the outer skirts of Saturn's rings and it's unstable. In fact, some scientists have described it as like natural braiding and unbraiding of like a girl's hair because it's so fine. So what we got here? So you're gonna see Saturn and you're gonna see all these little stars that are right next to it. Many of them are moons. The one that kind of looks fuzzy over here is the moon Titan. Now, in one of my previous videos, I did talk about Titan and why we sent a probe to Titan to discover some of the unique features. I highly recommend checking out that video. I'll leave a link in the description below for that as well. So what's unique about Saturn other than its beautiful ring system? Well, one of the fun facts I always enjoy about Saturn is I like to call Saturn the rubber ducky of the solar system. And here's why. The average density of Saturn is less than that of water. So density is taking an object's mass and dividing it by its volume. So for as massive as Saturn is, when you spread it out over its big, huge volume, it's very, very light for its size. In fact, if we were to take Saturn and put it into a swimming pool, it would float like a rubber ducky because the average density of Saturn is 0.6 cubic centimeters or grams per cubic centimeter, whereas in density of water is one. So anything that has a density less than water floats in water. 
All right, so let's zoom back out. So since we've taken a look at these two big gas giants that we can prominently see, let's take a look at a few other features that we can see in the evening sky. So over here towards the west, you kind of see these three bright stars that kind of form a triangle. This is what is known as the Summer's Triangle or the Navigator's Triangle. It's an asterism or a nickname given by different people. The navigators often used it because it helped them figure out some of their cardinal points as well as they used it for directions. In fact, the Polynesians often used these three different stars when they were navigating the ocean. In fact, the Disney movie Moana shows that prominently when they were talking about wayfinders and they were using their hands, that's how they would navigate. It was basically their hand was a form of a compass, really, or a sextant. So these three individual stars, even though they're, they're a part of the Summer Triangle, they're three individual constellations that these three stars are a part of. So this top star is in a constellation by itself. This star right here is called Vega. And it's a part of the constellation of Lyra, the liar. L-Y-R-E, not L-I-A-R. So let's bring up the constellations. So as you can see, there's quite a few different constellations, but some of them are a little harder to see. So I'm going to show you the ones that you could possibly see close to San Antonio. So you have the bright star Vega right here, and you have this pentagonal or um, unique type of shape. I want to say it's a rhombus, but it, not quite with this little weird twitch at the end. Close enough, anyway. Nonetheless, you have this unique shape right here, and it's supposed to be the lyre, the harp. Hidden between these two stars is a really unique object, and it's sometimes hard for me to click on it because it's so faint. So if you have a really good sized telescope right there, it's right between these two stars, and you are not gonna let me click on it. There we go. Now let's center on it. So hidden between these two stars is this faint object right here, which is known as the Ring Nebula. It's basically a telltale sign of what will happen to our star when it passes away. What's going on in our sun right now is a process known as nuclear fusion. And what's going on is lighter elements are being rammed together to produce lighter elements as well as light, heat, and energy. So those lighter elements are ramming together to produce other different elements, and then those elements ram together to produce a little heavier elements and so on, until eventually it starts running out of fuel. So what will happen is that it will collapse down its core to conserve energy, and then it'll puff out the excess layers that it doesn't need anymore, creating like this cosmic ash ball around the core remnant of the star. In fact, that little tiny white star in the center there is the core remnant of the star. Astronomers call them white dwarfs. So they're basically the later stages of life for a star. At least stars like our sun. Now, our sun is not gonna go off in a big, huge, massive explosion like many people think. It's not gonna go kaboom, it's gonna go Pfft. It's gonna burp, basically. I know, not as exciting, but I would rather have it go out in a burp and sustain our wonderful planet than it to basically be the violent big stars that do go epic explosions. All right, nonetheless, the other constellation that's a part of the Summer Triangle, this star right here, Deneb, which is a part of the Summer Triangle, is in the constellation Cygnus, the swan. Imagine a stick figure swan, okay? Yes, many people have asked me, why do the constellations not look exactly like what they portray it? Keep in mind, you had, back at ancient times, all you had was a campfire and the stars. And you often tell stories of death, danger, endless love, and you would sometimes place those stories in the stars. And you tried your best to 
connect the dots, so to say. And obviously stars don't exactly align to make pictures, but close enough. And that's what the great thing about asterisms is, is that you can make any constellation you desire and make up your own stories that you desire. It's just for astronomers, we stick with, stick with the Greek and Roman stories is because they were the longest standing as well as the most consistent over the years. Because they started in many of the constellations started in Greek times and they consisted throughout the years in the Roman times. And since they were kind of Greek and Roman, they made its way into Europe, those are the ones that stuck very well. Whereas many other cultures weren't as prominent during the Renaissance era versus many of them have changed over the course of time. So that's why we stick with the Greek and Romans. Nonetheless, at the tip nose of Cygnus right here is this unique star, it's called Alberio. It may look like a single star, but with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, you get to see two stars, in fact. These two stars are orbiting one another, so it's often called a binary star. And sometimes I like to call it the Cub Scout star because one's a deep gold and the other one's a bright blue, the colors of the Cub Scouts. And it, all most stars usually come in binary stars, it's just our sun is a unique star where it's a star by itself. The last star of the summer triangle right here is called Altair, and it's a part of the constellation Aquila, the eagle. Now, it's kind of hard to see the eagle. Sometimes I see a stingray out of this. Imagine kind of like the eagle on the back of a quarter kind of look. That's how I best could see it. You decide what you think is best. Nonetheless, let's look straight up right about here. And you'll see this big, huge square right here. In fact, let's take off the constellations and you can see that square a little better. This is a part of the constellation Pegasus, the cosmic winged horse. Now, it's kind of hard to see a beautiful cosmic winged horse like what you see in the Disney movie Hercules. I don't see it personally, so I like to refer to it as what the famous cowboy poet Baxter Black called it. He called it the great baseball diamond in the sky. And you kind of can see a baseball diamond out of this. So here's home, here's first, here's second, here's third, here you got the pitcher, here you got the catcher and the umpire right here. A couple guys hanging out in the dugout. You got the shortstop and a few guys out in the outfield. So it kind of can look like a baseball diamond. Nonetheless, allow me to show you a unique way of finding a dark sky object. So if you go from home to first, past the right fielder, past the center fielder, leave the stadium, and you can go buy a hot dog. This hot dog stand is a really unique object. Uh, it won't let me cl click on it either, but it's okay. I will force it. This unique object is the farthest thing you can see with your unaided eye. It's the Andromeda galaxy, our sister galaxy, which is 2.5 million light years away from us. So what do I mean by a light year? Well, in astronomy, there's a professional term for what we describe as quote unquote astronomy, or some people say, oh, it's the study of space. I like to call it the science of extremes. We look at the biggest of the bigs to the smalls of the smalls. And since we're looking at the biggest of the bigs, we have to use a huge yardstick. Sometimes we have to make up our own yardsticks or our own units to describe how vast space is. So when we talk about a light year, we're talking about the distance light has traveled in a year. So that's why we call it a light year. So, and another term we use is called parsecs. Now, yes, the movie Solo retconned that term, but in the original Star Wars, 
they said, oh, I did the 10, uh, the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs. They meant it to be a term of light or a unit of time when they didn't realize, oh, it's a unit of distance, nice try. So a parsec is a unit of distance that we use as well. And I can go into some of those different yardsticks if people are interested. Just leave it in the comments below if you'd like me to do a video on the unique yardsticks of astronomy. Nonetheless, when we talk about a light year, it's the distance light has traveled in a year. And since light has a finite speed, over the course of a year, one light year is roughly about 9 trillion miles. So it's pretty fast. So light travels pretty fast. In fact, uh, I think the average speed for light in a vacuum is 180 million kilometers per second. So pretty darn fast. So to go travel in a year is roughly about nine trillion miles. So it's a pretty long distance. So, so for something that is 2.5 million light years away means that it's nine trillion miles times 2.5 million it's that far away. And yet, we're able to see it with our unaided eye on a clear moonless night, which is really cool. Also, if you want to click off of something, you just simply right click, or you, yeah, you simply right click on the object anywhere. So if you want to click on something, like for example, here, we got the moon coming up. So you get to see the beautiful moon. If you want to not have all this wonderful image information display, you just simply right click anywhere and voila. Nonetheless, right next to the moon, you kind of see this red star right here. That's actually the planet Mars. So let's take a look at the planet Mars up close and personal, shall we? So if you have a really powerful telescope, not only can you see some of the features of Mars, you'll see these kind of two stars right here. Those two stars are actually the moons of Mars. They're not really moons per se, they're more like captured asteroids, but they still orbit Mars, so we call them moons. They're Phobos and Deimos, meaning fear and death. And so people are asked, have asked, why would they name them fear and death? Well, Mars was considered the god of war. So with war, you get fear and death. So taking an up close and personal view of Mars here, this crack right here, and it kind of extends even further, is called Valles Marineris or Mariner Valley. It is the grandest of Grand Canyons. It takes a look at our Grand Canyon and says, oh, how cute, you, you, you try so hard. It's okay, sweetie. And here's why. It's as deep as Mount Everest is high. It is so wide that it can fit the entire city of San Antonio in its basin. And it is so long that it stretches from New York to Los Angeles. Crazy, right? So it is literally the grandest of Grand Canyons and it exists on a planet that's about half the size of Earth. And another prominent feature of Mars right here is the biggest volcano in the solar system. It's called Olympus Mons. In fact, it is taller than Mount Everest by a mile. And it is so big that if we were to bring it back to Earth, it would cover the entire state of Texas. It's that big. All right, one more constellation before we wrap up today. So over here towards the east, you kind of see these unique little objects right here. One kind of looks like a V and the other one kind of looks like a little spoon in the sky. That V is actually a constellation. It's part of the constellation Taurus, the bull. And that V shape is often known as the Hyades. The bright star in the the constellation Taurus is right here and it's called Aldebaran. But 
this little object right here, which is tucked back behind Taurus, is given different names. It's called the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, the Seven Indian Maidens, the Seven Little Eyes of Monarihi, or Subaru. So yes, the Japanese car company named is named for a constant a group of stars in the sky. In fact, if you look on the emblem of a Subaru vehicle, you'll see these stars. Now, this is usually an object that you would better not to zoom in on because all you see is just a group of stars. But if you have like a spotting scope or a pair of binoculars and zoom in on it, you kind of see this beautiful little cluster of stars. That bluish haze is the nebula that created these stars. So here are some things that you can definitely see in the sky close to Thanksgiving. But there's one more thing I wanted to point out to you guys that's really unique that you can see here from San Antonio. It'll be a penumbral eclipse, but you're going to have to stay up late. It's into the evening of November 29th and into the early morning of November 30th. So let's change the date and time here. So, and let's change it to close to 1 a.m. If you look up at the moon, you kind of see it changes color. This is what is known as a penumbral eclipse. So roughly around about after midnight, 1 a.m. is when we start getting into a penumbral eclipse. A penumbral eclipse is not a total eclipse because it doesn't go into the darkest shadow of the Earth, but the semi-portion of the dark shadow of the Earth. What do I mean by that? Well, if you have the Earth right here and it kind of makes a shadow point, it's down at the bottom end of the shadow. So hence why it looks kind of like semi-distorted, kind of looks like it has a fuzzy haze on it, like a cloud went over it, but it could be a clear night. So on the 29th, you get to see a penumbral eclipse. It's not as fantastic as a total eclipse, but it's still pretty cool. In fact, if you want to mark your calendars on April 8th of 2024, we'll get to see a total solar eclipse through here, through Texas. In fact, the best place to go view it would be in Kerrville and or just a few miles west of San Antonio. So mark your calendars for April 8th of 2024. All right, so here are some of the constellation th things that you can see roughly around about Thanksgiving break. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down in the comments below. If there is a topic you would love for me to cover over, leave it down in the comments as well. I would be more than happy to discuss any type of topic you wish to have. Also, parents, if you're looking for some fun activities for your kids to do, I highly recommend futureadysa.org. It's a unique site that basically entertains education. It allows kids to play games and do fun activities while earning digital badges. So if you're looking for something fun and educational for your kids to do, I recommend futureadysa.org. I'll leave a link in the description below as well. Also around about this time of year, I have uh, people ask me, where can I get a fun gift for my loved one? And I know Christmas is coming up and many people are trying to plan ahead for the Christmas holiday. So allow me to point to you what is called Earth to Sky Calculus. Because many people want to say, oh, I want to buy my beloved a star or something of that nature. Many of the sites that you can quote unquote buy a star are hoaxes. And I highly don't recommend that. So what I do recommend is Earth to Sky Calculus. It's a group of students, high school students, that are launching high altitude balloons for research. And since they're launching these uh, balloons for research, they're getting credit towards college. But one of the fun things that they do is they send up objects into space with these high altitude balloons. And they sell these objects to help profit not only to be able to launch more balloons, but to help these students get scholarships to go into college. So I highly recommend checking out their store because some of the objects that they have for sale are really unique and fun. In fact, my necklace right here is a wonderful object I received as a gift and I can officially say it has been in space. 
So it's a fun idea to give for a space enthusiast, for a gift for Christmas, as well as you're helping a group of students be able to fulfill their dreams. So a win-win on multiple counts. I'll leave a link in the description below for their store if you want to check it out. So until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and as always, never stop learning.